Okay, the first thing we got to do, guys, we're going to flip this around. I need you to, like, wave. Everyone wave. Come on, everyone wave. Okay, excellent. This is, this is great because on Instagram, they need the behind-the-scenes stuff. Whenever I do stuff behind the scenes, people like, like it and share and comment and do all that stuff, right? So I'm just going to quickly post this to Instagram. Oh, I'm going to have to shrink that. There we go. And okay, so we're going to do it unfiltered. So we start out with hashtag unfiltered. Oops. I just put stuff on my fingers. And I can't type now. Unfiltered. That's not, oh, there we go. One million posts. Okay. Unfiltered. Okay, so, and then we do hashtag COVID-19. Because that one's trending too. Uh, and then hashtag, oops. I usually do this. Okay, so happy. So happy. That's good. Uh, to be sharing in front of live people. Hashtag no more puppets. Um, okay, and then, and then we'll do the call to action. So watch now. Uh, HTTPS. Oops. This is, I don't do this in front of people, and I'm nervous. My KWC. My KWC dot. CA. Okay, and then we'll share that on Twitter. And you guys want to be tagged? What's your handles? I can tag everybody. I got time. That's why I'm doing this, okay? And then it actually helps me because I don't have to do it later. Anyway, so it is now shared. No, it's still posting. There we go. Okay. It is good to be back somewhat together and hear your voice echo, echo, echo through everywhere. Quite the time we're in, hey? <laughs> I want to uh, begin by looking at Matthew 24. We don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I want to highlight a few things. Matthew 24, Jesus, his disciples are checking out the, the uh, temple. And they're quite impressed. And Jesus tells them, there's not going to be any stone left upon the other. And so then they ask him, I think, three questions. Some Bible translators turn it into two. But I think there's three questions they ask him. They ask him, when will the temple be destroyed? They ask him, what will be the signs of your coming? And they ask him, what will be the end of the age? Now, there's no doubt in my mind that they thought all those things happened at the same time. But we know the temple was destroyed in 73 AD. We know that the end of the age happened when Jesus died on the cross and rose again and a new age came in. There's a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. It's not the same. Jesus took back all authority and he gave it to us. It's a different world we're living into out in after the cross. And his coming back, it's been 2,000 years and we still haven't seen it. That sounds terrible if you just take that little bit of a sound bite, but let's start reading here, okay? Verse 24, Jesus says, chapter 24, verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but it, the end is not yet. 
For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, and these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will be delivered up, they, then they'll deliver you to up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my sake. And then many people will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But those who endure to the end shall be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you are God. And Lord, I thank you that we can trust you because you are the one who is trustworthy. I thank you, Lord, that no matter what situation our world is facing, no matter what we as individuals and as families are facing, we know that you are our king, and that's a very good thing. So I pray today, God, that we would be encouraged to trust you in the middle of every storm, to trust you regardless of what happens. And Lord, to do more than trust, but to shine bright in the darkness, because that's why you have us here. In your name we pray, amen. You know, part of what we read Jesus said would happen really seems like it's happened in the last few months. Wars and rumors of war. Uh, Russia and Saud, the, the House of Saud had an economic war that dropped the price of oil down to less than nothing. The, I don't know if you saw, but North Korea is strongly threatening South Korea. It could happen within days, within weeks. There is a uh, nation will rise against nation. Literally, in the Greek, that's ethnos, epi ethnos. That is tribe versus tribe. That's race relations. Pestilences. Literally, that's epidemics. Hello? People being offended and hating each other. No. That seems like a new thing, right? I need to point out again that Jesus said, see to it that you're not troubled. Why couldn't he say that? If you go to Isaiah chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60, it says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines over you. For look, darkness covers the earth, total darkness to the people, but the Lord will shine over you. His glory will, will appear over you. As long as you and I are here, God has a purpose for us to be here. That purpose is to be that light like the moon that shines the light of the sun to the side of the world that's away from the sun. That is his purpose in us and for us. And that's why he tells us to arise and shine in a great darkness. The darker the night, the brighter my light. What the world is facing right now, it's not up for governments to solve. It can't be solved by legislation. It won't happen through diplomatic means. It only happens when we get a new heart. When the heart of stone is removed and it's, we're given a heart of flesh, then we'll follow his decrees, then we'll keep his laws, then he will be his people and he will be our God. It's not about what they're doing over there. It's what's happening here. It's what's happening here. We need that to happen here. 
The only thing that's going to make a difference is if we change. And by the way, that's the only thing you can control. (laughs) With Holy Spirit's help. You're not going to be able to do this on your own. I'm not. After listening to the conversation happening in the U.S. about race relations we got to realize it's not just an American discussion. Around the world, people are being discriminated against because of their skin or their religion or their language or any other thing we can use to make an us and them. Everywhere. Did you know in Iran, if you're Afghani, your kids can't go to school? You know, my my friend Justin is a black guy, black man. He was raised in Beaumont, Alberta. When he began to drive, not only he told me this, but his dad, who's white, told me this too. Adopted dad. Um, The RCMP in Beaumont would routinely pull Justin over just to see what a black man was doing in Beaumont. My son-in-law is Filipino. His parents came from the Philippines. He was born in Canada, but he looks Filipino. So I asked him, I said, Ray, have you ever experienced discrimination or do you still experience racism? And he told me stories. And one of, like, he walking down the street with a friend and somebody throw a drink out the window and say, go back to your country. That's in Mill Woods. Have you ever gone to a Canadian penitentiary? It is absolutely shameful how many natives are there. I've been in some where it's tough to find a white guy except who's not a guard. The guards are white. But it's shameful. Absolutely shameful as a country, what we're doing. My friend Justin is living down in the States now, and he's been instigating conversations with people. Uh, And I was able to listen into one on, uh, they had a Zoom call the other day, so I listened in. And... Justin said something that I think really opened up my eyes. I thought it was the most intelligent thing said in an hour and a half of really intelligent things said. Justin said that privilege is a spectrum. It's not that some people have privilege and other people don't. He says, we all have some privilege. He said, as a black man, I have more privilege than a black woman in the States. He said, I can get angry in public and not be written off as an angry black woman. A black woman doesn't have that privilege in the States. I'm a white, Anglo, heterosexual, well-educated, fairly lucid, evil-bodied man. If I could add independently wealthy, there is absolutely nothing in this country legally or socially that I couldn't do. Especially now that I can self-identify as any of you. I know that I get away with things that some of you would never even consider doing. A couple of years ago, we had um, two well-built, body-armored police officers come up to our door, and uh, they were looking to find witnesses to a crime that took place, and it turned out like at the time the crime took place, nobody was around, so we couldn't help them, but I wanted to encourage them. I wanted to say something nice, so I said, 
it's really, I, I really appreciate living in a city where two policemen come to my door and I don't feel threatened in any way. And they got offended and turned around and left. And then I realized what they were thinking. So I yelled out after them. I said, I was complimenting your integrity, not insulting your manliness, you goofs. You know, upon reflection, I realized I probably shouldn't have added you goofs. <laughs> but as a white, Anglo, heterosexual, well-educated, fairly lucid, able-bodied man, I didn't even think that I couldn't say that. I have a privilege other people don't have, and it's not to insult people with guns. In fact, we all have a privilege from God. Look at what it says in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. It says, For you have been called to freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Freedom is another word for privilege. If you have privilege, you have freedom to do whatever you want. You and I have privilege. We have freedom to serve each other in love. That's what we need to do with whatever privilege we have. It's our privilege to serve others in love. The darker the night, the brighter your light. How do you live out this freedom to serve others? I'll tell you, it can get overwhelming to think of all the needs all around. You and I need to be like Jesus. One of the things Jesus did was he allowed himself to be led by compassion. His compassion led to healings. In Matthew 29, uh, or 20, 29 to 32, he heals two blind men, and it says, Jesus moved with compassion, healed. His compassion led to healings. His compassion led to miracles. Matthew 14, when he saw the great multitude, he was moved with compassion for them, so he healed their diseases, and then they had no food, so he performed this miracle out of his compassion. His compassion led to resurrection. Jesus never went to a funeral that he didn't ruin. He runs into this funeral coming out of Nain, and, and he looked at the, at the mother and, and had compassion for her and went to the open casket, and the boy was raised back to life. His compassion led to commissioning. I want to take some time to explore this one, because this, the, the, Matthew 9, um, this is amazing. Uh, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages in the area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. How many of you have ever been confused and helpless? Like in the last week? Uh, guess what? Jesus has compassion on you. That's a good sermon right there. We should just leave it. That's a good sermon. God, Jesus has compassion. But there's more. Like a sh confused and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, The harvest is great and the workers are few, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send out more workers into the field. Now some of us get confused that the next chapter break that happened so many, like it happened in the Middle Ages, they put in chapters. The original book didn't have the headings of the chapters. It went from here to the commission of the twelve and he sent them out. It literally, Jesus literally said, pray to send out people and oh by the way, you're the answer to your own prayers. 
Sometimes the prayers you pray don't get answered because you're the answer to the prayers and you're not doing what God's telling you to do. Gets back to what I'm saying. The only thing that's going to change the situation of our world is us allowing Holy Spirit to change our hearts. Our hearts. I'm learning I need to be led by compassion so I can be more and more and more like Jesus. What do I know about compassion? I know that I can choose to clothe myself with compassion. Colossians 3.12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It's my choice to choose to clothe myself in compassion. I can choose to shut off my compassion. Look at this verse, uh, 1 John 3.17. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, but shuts off his compassion for him, how can the love of God reside in him? I can shut off my compassion. I know I can shut off. I felt myself shut off my compassion. Because compassion leads to me doing something and Ah. Although I've also found when I'm led by compassion and I do something, God blows me away with what he, what he actually ends up doing. Yeah, I know it's my choice to be led by compassion. 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. I know it's up to me to act on the compassion I feel. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God, Christ and God forgave you. The darker the night, the brighter my light, and I need to be led by compassion. You and I have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. We belong to God. We cannot react the way the world reacts. We can't judge the way the world judges. Let, let me just give you an example here. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Okay? It's okay to become angry. It's good to be angry sometimes. A person with authority using authority to murder another person is wrong. It's evil. A white guy in a mask breaking windows during a protest is wrong. A president breaking up a peaceful protest to go for a photo op is wrong. Looters robbing and damaging businesses when opportunity presents itself is wrong. Police targeting a black boy being raised in Beaumont is wrong. Some idiot throwing some kind of drink at my son-in-law is wrong. The way our justice system, we don't have a justice system, we have a law system in this country, and it's wrong, 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 wrong. It's okay to be angry, but in your anger, don't sin. And don't make excuses for people who do. Before we say anything, before we share anything on Facebook, uh, I'm learning this. Before, we just, just think before you speak. What do I mean, mean by think? Okay, think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it intelligent? Please follow that one. Is it intelligent? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Do you know you and I are not to speak any words that isn't for the building up of others? What? 
In your anger, don't sin. Let me give you a very pertinent example. Uh, have you ever want to correct anyone for, you know, you get tired of these posts, I know. All black, all black lives matter. Well, don't all lives matter? Have you ever gone to the website for Black Lives Matter? They are promoting hateful, evil things. Should we as Christians promote this evil organization by saying Black Lives Matter? Well, we need to understand what truth is and what speaking the truth in love is. Let's say my wife comes to me and asks, am I beautiful? And I tell her, everyone's beautiful. It's the truth, right? It's not the truth she needs to hear. I'm not speaking in love because I'm not thinking of her needs and her wants and what is going to help her. I have a friend come to me who's, you know, distraught, and he tells me, my dad died, and I, and I just... All parents die. It's the truth. It's not the truth spoken in love because the truth spoken in love would say, my dad died and I kind of know what you might be feeling, but I don't know what you're feeling, so I'm shutting up now. Can we sit and I'm just here for you? I don't have the answers. Let me listen to you. The truth spoken in love thinks about what the other person needs to hear. It's not discounting the greater truth. It's not like, understand, every life matters from conception to natural death. Can I say that? Catholics say that. Of course I can say that. That's what, Jesus, that's what the Bible shows. But there's a truth that needs to be understood that in the States, and downtown Edmonton, and in small town Beaumont, black lives matter a different way than everyone else. At least to some people. Before you say anything, before you post anything, I want you to think, is it true, is it helpful, is it intelligent, is it necessary, is it kind? Why? Because you're a child of the king and you're the only Jesus some people ever see. So it matters what you say, it matters what you post, it matters what you do. You know what Jesus said in... in uh, Matthew 25, who are the righteous? He calls the righteous those who feed the hungry, those who give drink to the thirsty. He welcomes the strangers. He clothes the naked. He takes care of the sick and those, visits those in prison. That's who the righteous are according to Jesus. And I want to know, you Christian, you Christ-like follower, how much do you do that? You can't do all of it now. I mean, we're still in lockdown in some ways. I get that. But are you intentional about inviting the stranger over? Are you intentional about feeding the hungry? The challenge I have for you today, and the challenge I want to hammer into us as we go forward into what God has next for us as a church, I want us, all of us, to start forming relationships with somebody who we would consider a stranger. Someone who doesn't look like us or act like us or whatever. Whatever, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to do. You are, you are looking to become friends with someone just 
to find out about them, just to learn how they think, just to learn how they feel, just to you're, it's, understand you're not trying to win them for Jesus. It's not this, I, you're my token pagan, so I want to get you on my prayer list. Leave that alone. Yes, you need to be ready to give a defense for anything they ask, for when they ask a reason for the hope you have. But that means you got to live in such a way that they see the hope that you have and want to ask that question. The, the challenge for us is to make friends or at least start conversations with people who we would consider strangers. The purpose is to just hear how they think. Very least, if you've been in Canada for five generations, make friends with someone who's new. My wife is an immigrant. I can be friends with her. No, somebody new. Somebody, somebody that's not new to you. And oh, by the way, it's someone outside the church. Okay? Someone, that, that's, that's the thing. It's not in here. Those are friendships you just have because you have. And you need to have them. But the ones, you're, the people who you consider stranger, they've got to be outside the, the, the understanding of the church. It's not that you get some great friend who just moved here from the Maritimes, because they're all Christians. Every person I meet from the Maritimes are always Christian. It's because I always meet them in church. My goodness. Um... Yeah. Why is this so important? Because it's important because we can't make blanket statements about a people group when we know someone in that people group. When we were in university, yeah, I found this completely hilarious. My uh, uh, Karen and I met Karen and Shirley in a Bible study group. Uh, and we would meet in the prayer room at the student union building. And one day during Ramadan, there was a group of Muslims praying there, and we had to wait to get in. And the, the uh, person who was leading our Bible study, the responsible adult, came to me and said, you know, Trevor, I don't know why he came to me. He said, Trevor, these guys are the radical Muslims. Don't tick them off in any way. Don't say anything that's going to be taken by offense. These guys are serious Muslims. They're Shia Muslims. And I'm like, okay, I can not say anything. Bless God. You know what happened? The first person who came out was my friend Philos. I said, Philos, how are you, my friend? I give him a hug. Happy Ramadan. How's it going? And he introduced me to his friends who just came from prayer. And the, the, my, my, the, the leader, his jaw was on the floor because, yeah. I knew Philos. I wasn't afraid of these people. They were people. They were awesome. He, him and I were took classes together. We had a good time. We were actually taking biblical Hebrew, Hebrew together. Anyway, you can't make blanket statements about people when you know somebody. The only way we're going to change things is if we change this. The only way we can change this is with Holy Spirit's help. We need to ask him to activate our compassion. We need to ask him to ignite that spark in us again. And we need to trust him that he'll give us the boundaries to follow. Because when compassion gets activated, everybody we see, we want to help. But be, use, be wise. And, and, but I think, I think it is wise to follow compassion. I, I honestly think God does amazing things when we follow what Jesus followed. You know, Jesus only did what he saw the Father do. He only said what he heard the Father say. And, and we, that's our goal to be like Jesus, is to live that way too. Now, God is God called the God of all compassion. 
And if Jesus was led by compassion, because God is the God of all compassion, don't you think you and I need to pray that our compassion gets activated again? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's time we pray. I want you to know that you can be the answer to your own prayers. God's placed it on your heart to see things changed in this world. Guess what? He's calling on you to start changing you so you can change the world. If you're praying for God to change things in your situation or your family or your workplace, well, guess what? You're the answer to that prayer. He's asking you to act, asking you to ask him to activate your compassion. Stand and pray. Receive this if you want to receive it. And if not, we'll pray for your salvation later. I'm going to start by reading. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, and then I'll get into the prayer. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have prepared us for the work that you have called us to. And Lord, I thank you that you have put around us those people that you want us to have influence on. I thank you, Father, that even now you're stirring in us that friend, that neighbor, that co-worker, that person across the street, that bus driver, whoever you're stirring in our hearts, Lord, to get to know, just to know, not to, not to evangelize, but to know. And I pray, Lord God, that you would give us whole, not only boldness, but compassion to follow, to make those relationships and to stretch out and, and stretch ourselves in that. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the ones who are so looking forward to inviting people into their homes or going out and, and, and meeting again with people. Lord, this doesn't mean that we don't do anything until that's possible. But right now, Holy Spirit, you will give us new and different ways to see you at work in people's lives. It might be a, however, however you want to do that, Lord, we are open to that. And Lord, for those of us who want our hearts to be set aflame again, right now, Lord, I pray for your fire to fall on us, your fire of compassion, so that we would have eyes to see what you see, we would have hearts to know what you want us to do, and we have hands that are ready to do your work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And amen. You can be seated. I'm sure we have more videos for the crowd at home.